everybody. Thank you so much for joining me this afternoon for this spoken word session. It's such a treat to be here sharing some, some words and this next hour with you. So uh, my name is Imogen Sterling and I am a writer, spoken word poet and theatre maker working in Glasgow. I specialise in live performance, uh, specifically performance poetry. And my main area of interest, I suppose, is creating long form. So one hour to 90 minute approximately spoken word theatre shows that are paired with music. And I'm also the co-founder of new theatre company Siren. Siren is a team of four women from a whole mixture of creative backgrounds. So we've got poetry, uh, we have theatre, music, um, directing, writing, cabaret, a whole blend. And our company intends to create genre-defying shows that upset the traditional expectations of theatre, what theatre is, how theatre exists today, and tackle a range of social issues that are important to us. At the moment, we are working with the Tron Theatre in Glasgow on a show called, poignantly, Text Me When You Get Home, um, which is a gig theatre show about female safety on nights out uh, in the city and the hypervigilance required by women. I bring the spoken word poetry element to the company and that style of uh, performance and of writing is very important to text me when you get home. Now, the, the spoken word uh, in any form, be it um, spoken word poetry, um, theatre, public speaking, or to be honest, just speaking aloud quite simply is a really brilliant tool for claiming your space, for garnering self-confidence and for boosting self-esteem. It is an immensely stressful and immensely anxiety inducing time at the moment and a time too where I think everybody has an experience and a story to share. For young people specifically, I think it is a, a very difficult time. The landscape is shifting and you may not be as as best represented as you could or indeed should uh, be. So I think that introducing spoken words uh, to young people is a great way of encouraging you to, to find your voice and then use that voice to express what is, it, what is important to you. Um, on that note, for this session, for the next hour, all you will need is a means to write. So a pen and paper, computer, phone, whatever works best for you. And I'll be working through a series of, of exercises in real time. So I will introduce each exercise and then give you a set amount of time to complete the task at home. And the exercises that I've chosen, some are writing exercises, some are more delivery focused and they are ones which I use personally uh, to help create my own pieces of spoken word. And so should hope you, should hope you, should help you, I hope, on the, uh, on the journey to, to writing your own pieces. Um, today will be fast paced. Um, I'm really only going to allocate about five minutes or so to each exercise, simply so that we can cover ground and so that I can fit as much content as I can into the hour, into the session. But I would very much advise that you return to the exercises um, take more time with them. Um, delve into them in your own time, in your own space. Give yourself the time that you need. Today is kind of a, an introductory session, I suppose. And I think too that um, teaching spoken word online uh, is always particularly strange. Um, more so when we are looking at performance and delivery techniques. So today really is an insight, I guess, into the genre of spoken word and how you may be able to write it and how you might be able to use it. We will, as I say, do a few delivery techniques together and I will also share some tips of my own uh, to practice in your own time. I've always found that very helpful myself, um, having other people share their processes and their ideas. Um, but I really would encourage you to Get in touch after the session if you have questions, if you have work that you'd like to share, or if you realize that you're interested in exploring spoken word further. And I will see what opportunities I can offer because I say, as I say, I think it's a, a vital time just now to be exploring spoken word. 
So as I say, please feel free to contact me after the session at any point. You can get me on my email address, imogensterlingpoetry at gmail.com, or you can find me and also Siren Theatre on just about any social media platform. So with that in mind, with our introduction out the way, we are going to start off today's session by working through a few exercises that help me um, when crafting a spoken word poem. They're kind of my four, my four step uh, exercise journey, if you like. And obviously it does vary from person to person uh, and from poem to poem. But I suppose these exercises give a general idea of uh, where, where my process is at. So when I am sitting down with a blank page, ready to begin crafting spoken word piece, I tend to begin with free writing. So free writing um, is really the most freeing type of writing, as the name suggests. It is a type of writing where you do not have to think about spelling or punctuation, grammar, none of these kind of logistical, practical aspects. Um, you don't have to think about being neat or sounding clever, or sounding sophisticated. You simply need to get your thoughts out. It is, it's a way to write openly and honestly. It's the starting point in that way for a whole lot of mindful, expressive po uh, poetry because it allows us really to tap directly into what we're feeling um, and get those feelings out of ourselves and onto the page, which in itself is a very cathartic process. Essentially, it is stream of consciousness put on the page. So to do this exercise, we firstly need to choose a topic to, to write about. Spoken words is, it's about expression, it's about emotion, honesty, communication. It's an art form where you are speaking directly to another person. And that, for the most part, tends to be used either to share common experience or common emotion or to educate or inform. For the purpose of today, we're going to focus on the former, emotion. Um, and so with that in mind, I would like you to just write down the simple phrase, uh, 2020 made me feel, dot, 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 2020 made me feel. This will be your starting line, and we're just going to take it from there. I would like you to write as much as you can, generate as much content as you can, leading from that line. Um, Nobody is judging you. Nobody is going to read this. So just try to write openly, honestly, quickly, spontaneously. Just try to get as many words on the page as you can. Uh, this will be useful, actually, because we'll be using this chunk of material now to influence the exercises to follow. Um, I do appreciate that as much as free writing is intended to be liberating, you know, existing without restraint, um, it can actually be quite daunting to be faced with the blank page. Uh, hence why I find a kind of starting line for Simulus 2020 made me feel to be useful. Um, but at the same time, if you're writing and you find yourself getting stuck, your brain is just going blank, I would encourage you to return to the five key question words of what, where, why, when, and who. Uh, in this case, what was it that you were feeling? When were you feeling it? Where were you feeling it? Why were you feeling it? Uh, who was involved or with you when you were feeling it? Just to sort of kickstart your brain again. So 2020 made me feel a free writing exercise for five minutes, just as much content as you can get. I will let you know when we've got about 30 seconds to go and then we will move on together to our next exercise. Okay, 2020 made me feel. Five minutes of free writing starting now.
Okay, guys, let's take 30 seconds more and then we'll be wrapping up our free writing. Okay, let's call it there. As I say, don't worry at all if you're finding yourself pushed for time, you're not producing as much as you'd like. These are just introductory exercises which you can expand upon whenever, whenever you desire. So we have created our free written piece, which as I say, tends to be my own starting point for spoken words. Um, normally I'll give myself uh, either a very intensive sort of 15 minute block maybe to do some free writing or about 30 minutes, um, allowing for hand cramp and moments for your mind to kind of go blank. So I find 15 or 30 minutes um, to work best. So you can kind of experiment with, with both. Um, and after doing the free written kind of session, the content that you end up with is great. It's, uh, it's honest, it's, it's a lot, it is imaginative often, but it's frequently too much, it's too rambly. And Poetry is unique in that you can get to the heart of an issue, um, right to the, to the center of a subject in fewer words than you might do with prose. So at this point, I like to introduce uh, erasure or blackout techniques. Um, they're great, well, they're one and the same really. They're kind of two alternative names for the same technique, which is a great one to pair with free writing. It is essentially the process of erasing or obscuring words in an original piece of text to create something new. Um, so you can apply this technique as we will do to our own writing, or you can apply it to somebody else's writing, uh, something pre-existing, a book, a magazine, a newspaper, a poster, a pamphlet, anything containing a, a body of text in order to create a new um, original piece uh, from something that already exists, which is pretty cool. And if you haven't come across it before, I'd really advise that you go on a Pinterest or Google Images, Instagram, and, and look up some examples of erasure or blackout poetry because it can be absolutely beautiful. People um, create real, real art, actually, out of obscuring some of the words and end up with this product that really blurs the line between writing and, and visual art. It's, it's lovely. For our purpose, Erasure poetry is it's a wonderful tool for simplifying your thoughts and for kind of distilling the essence of an often very chaotic mind into something bite-sized and manageable. And it's good to, as a means to sort of protect yourself when, when talking about sensitive material. Um, in spoken word, it's, it's important to be careful, I think, with what you're sharing, both for yourself, um, and for your audience who will be listening to your words, who don't have the opportunity to think that's a bit too much, I'm gonna close the page as you would um, with page poetry. Instead, the audience are there listening to whatever story, whatever experience you are sharing. Certainly with Siren, um, with the, the show that we're creating at the moment, it's full of, of material that might be very um, upsetting or, or, or triggering if put across in a way that isn't sensitive or properly supported. And so quite often when I've been writing my own work to bring to the show, I've applied this process of getting the, the material in the first place through free writing and then applying these erasure techniques to go back through it, um, cut it down, consider what I'm saying, consider what is appropriate both for myself and for um, the show's potential audience. So I'd like you now to take another five minutes to go back through the, the free writing that you just produced and essentially remove all the, all the fluff, all the overwriting. Um, if you've used pen and paper, you can black out the text. If you're on a computer, you can either like properly delete uh, the writing or it can be quite nice to italicize or strike through the words that you don't want just to see where 
your chosen words sort of fit within the original template. It's entirely up to yourself. What we're really doing is looking for keywords um, for phrases that really jump out and resonate with us. Uh, we're looking for unnecessary repetition. We're looking for rambling. And I'd say just remember too that it is poetry. Uh, what you're left with doesn't necessarily need to make sense, doesn't need to constate, con constitute full, complete narrative sentences. Um, so just allow yourself a bit of a bit of fun and abstract leniency with what you're leaving in. So five minutes again at this point to just go back through your free writing. Keep the key bits, keep what you like, remove the fluff, end up with a nice distilled version of the free written content. And again, I'll let you know when we've got about 30 seconds left before moving on to our next exercise. Okay, so that's our five minutes starting now.
Okay, folks, we're 30 seconds to go. Okay, well, let's wrap that one up there. That's given us a little insight, at least, to the erasure technique, which we can apply to our free writing to distill it down into something a little bit more uh, coherent and manageable, perhaps. We're going to move on now to delving into possibly one of my favourite writing styles, which is univocal writing. Essentially, the process of using just one vowel or limited vowels uh, within your writing. It's a style of writing which I believe was invented in the 60s um, by a group of French poets called the Oulipo. So that's uh, O-U-L-I-P-O, -O, all in capitals, uh, which was a group dedicated to inventing new ways of writing. They believed that adding extra rules to writing encouraged us to use our imaginations in new and unexpected ways. And I would not say they were wrong. Um, when it comes to spoken words, univocal writing is very interesting because while it is a style, a technique that is incredibly restricting, um, torturous almost, the, the beauty and the oral delicacies of the univocal poem prove to be really perfect for spoken word poetry because when you can only use one vowel, and therefore only the, the sounds that that one vowel can produce, you are offered this real feast of potential assonance and rhyme, which are two excellent um, techniques for, for poetry that you're listening to, like spoken words. Um, for myself, when I'm working on spoken word pieces, I will often start by drafting a piece univocally and then building from it rather than starting with the free writing technique or I will introduce a univocal aspect at this point having done the free writing having done the erasure to see um, to just approach my same sort of theme and content but just from a different direction and I, I really like univocal writing too because when when you're using the style you're kind of forced to stop worrying about what you're writing and instead just focus on how you're writing it because it is so uh, limited, it's so restricted. So you're forced to move away from narrative and structure and instead into more abstract simplicity and expression. I, I'm just going to read actually a short example of a univocal piece because sometimes it's easier just to listen to it rather than have me explain it. Um, so this is a piece from this brilliant collection, this script by Jenny Lindsay, um, where Jenny, the, the title poem, uh, this script is a, it's a part univocal piece in and about the letter I. Um, so it goes, it opens with, um, since six, it's so hard to read, since six, it imprints in skin, this girl script, this birthright which kills spirit. Whilst timid lips twitch, shh, girls swirl mildly within this, is itch in this skin, in this script. So you see that it's just the very, very beginning section uh, of the script using solely the letter I, the vowel I. Um, and the poem goes on in this vein and it's interesting because I suppose Jenny could have used more um, technically correct narrative focused language to to get her point across but instead what she's used is so satisfying to listen to um the short harsh brutal language lends something very interesting there's something so visceral to it and when you're writing univocal words it can be a very frustrating process but i would just push you to try to try to make peace with that and try to embrace the simple um, abstract feel uh, that, that comes with the writing that you produce. 
again, returning to to the spoken word and to performing your work. When you're performing spoken word, you really are, you're sharing a part of yourself so overtly, so directly, you're literally taking yourself and your story and your experience and putting it on a platform, on a stage, frequently in front of, of strangers. And that can be a very vulnerable position. Um, it can be easy to, to overshare to an extent that leaves you vulnerable and it's important to try to protect yourself. So sometimes when you begin writing with such constraints, it can keep your mind from the sort of oversharing part and instead just allow you to build out from a simpler core, I think. Um, so for this univocal exercise, we've been thinking about emotion and experience over the past strange year. So I would like you to choose two vowels. I would recommend A and E because they're the most widely used and so you'll have most scope with language. Uh, and just come up with as many words, phrases, short sentences as you can relating to that feeling. So as an example, for me, I wrote about, or I was thinking, sorry, about kind of feelings of uncertainty and precariousness, feeling unsettled. Those were my sort of overriding feelings over the past year. Uh, and so I came up with using just A and E, um, artless, I was very much without my art, uh, sad days, watch news, where next, what next, can't rest, can't relax. So that just gives you a really simple example of short phrases and words that I came up with using A and E. Um, and it's interesting to see what you're left with. You're left with abstract phrasing, yes. You're left too with satisfying vocals that are quite nice to listen to. And you're left with very concise communication. All of these things being crucial components to spoken word poetry. So again, I'm gonna give you five minutes. This one definitely warrants more than five minutes. So do not worry whatsoever if you find yourself with very little by the end of the five minutes. But just to come up with as many short words, um, feelings, uh, phrases, sentences as you can. I would advise using A and E, but again, if you wish to, to test yourself, feel free to choose another or to just use one vowel, of course. Uh, come up with as many words as you can, a little bank of them in this univocal style. Five minutes on that. Um, try not to get too frustrated. It is hard. And um, as before, I'll give you a th 30 second warning before we move on to our next exercise. So that is five minutes starting from now.
Okay, folks, 30 second warning just there for you. Okay, let's call it there. I would be very intrigued to to hear how you found the univocal style. It is a yeah, it's it's quite something to play around with, but it's it's really good fun if you invest some proper time in it and and see what you can produce. It can be very beautiful both to read on the page and to listen to. Um, our final it's not so much an exercise; it's just a technique that I'm going to kind of introduce here uh, relates directly to the univocal style. Um, I can't remember who used this metaphor, so if you're watching, let me know. Uh, but somebody once described univocal poetry as being like um, riding a mechanical bull. I can't remember what the actual name is for those mechanical bulls. But you know the one, the one that you have to like, hold on to and it tries to throw you off. Uh, in that you are quickly having to learn how to let it lead. You are having to learn its pattern so that you don't inadvertently resist it. However, what can be really effective is actually letting yourself be thrown from the bull. So to break the metaphor, uh, using a sentence or two to disrupt the univocal structure uh, for effect or for impact, breaking the, uh, the pattern that you've established and returning to standard language. Um, again, if we return to um, Jenny's poem here at the end, um, the poem and the collection is it's about being a woman, it's about the female experience, with the title poem, the script interrogating the subject, perhaps in the most sort of overt manner. Um, the poem discusses and then rejects the female stereotype and leads up to this really brilliant moment where she, uh, she rejects the univocal pattern uh, in order to mirror the kind of breaking of, of rules and dismissal of stereotypes. So she starts, uh, and still univocal, she goes, kick it, Stick it in bins brimming with skin flicks, high five other eyes, and then gradually introduces um, other vowels and other words. Let a collective eye light up within winning shin kickings, so still quite univocally focused there. Bitches reclaim this script. Be singing, one is not born, one becomes woman. Oops, off script. And then she returns to the univocal style. And I just think it's brilliant because she is using uh, this disruptance of her own writing style to mirror the disruptance within the content and the theme of the piece. And I just think it's really, really smart. And so I'd advise you when you've crafted more of a, of a univocal piece, um, probably more than we generated in, uh, in that exercise there, to experiment with adding a word or a sentence that breaks the univocal structure, that introduces more vowels, and just see what see what that lends the poem, see how that changes its impact. It can be really interesting. So that's the mechanical bull exercise, let's call it. And at this point, that kind of concludes the four key writing exercises or techniques that I use to form a spoken word poem. Um, so free writing, erasure poetry, uh, univocal language, and then experimenting with this mechanical bull idea. For the remainder of the session, so for the next kind of 20 minutes or so, I'm gonna be focusing on thinking a little bit more about performance and delivery. Um, to begin with, so I'll probably do like three very short exercises and then maybe share a few tips of my own kind of towards the end. Um, yes, to start off with, spoken word is, so fun, in my opinion, uh, because you have you have control over how you perform it. So you can add so much to a piece by the way in which you deliver it, whether you're choosing to read it fast or slow, um, loud or quiet. In doing so, when thinking about your delivery style, what I kind of encourage is just to make sure that everything is deliberate. So make sure there is real intention behind your choices. I tend to think of there being emotional intention and then stylistic intention. 
um, emotional intention, implying that there is genuine, honest uh, emotion behind the words that you're saying, and stylistic intention being that when you choose to do something with your performance style, be that speed up, slow down, uh, raise or lower the volume, there's a, a reason for doing so. So it doesn't have to be necessarily obvious what you would expect, such as um, you know whispering, lowering your voice, speaking more softly when you reach a serious part of your poem. Um, it might be that you reach the serious part and you decide to shout, you decide to speed up. Whatever you choose to do is wonderful, is brilliant. I think you should simply be able to justify your choices, to have a reason for doing what it is that you're doing. Um, to give a, an example from a piece of my own, um, I've got a piece uh, that I perform about Glasgow. It's a, a sort of a love-hate letter to the city, I suppose, talking about my experiences, uh, my time here. And there's a bit that goes, it's always very difficult to just drop in in the middle of a poem. <clears throat> it goes, um, OMG, oh my Glasgow, it's been years. I've been so far from you, so why are your arms still home to me? Why this yin and yang unity? Why does bed with you come so naturally when I broke my back trying to break your mold trying to cast off your embrace, safe face and forget you, Glasgow? So that's a very short excerpt of a much longer piece. Um, but even within that little excerpt, I think it still demonstrates the sort of range of uh, dynamics that I try to include within it. For example, the OMG, uh, I tend to read kind of loudly, but also slowly um, for impact, to stress the, the humor of it, to get people paying attention to it. The Oh My Glasgow, I tend to also have spaced and definite and also leave a little pause afterwards for laughter hopefully if laughter does not come i just hold the pause waiting for the laughter to come um i move on to the bit about uh it's been years i've been so far from you and for this section i really try to to slow it down to elongate uh the word years and the word far to emphasize the the length of time that i spent in the in the city and then when it gets to the end, to the while his bed with you comes so naturally, um, it speeds right up. And, and I think that's an example of there both being emotional and stylistic intention. The kind of emotional intention behind that choice is to symbolize the, the sort of clutter of my experience in the city, all the, the people and the and the things and the stories and the places, this whole whirlwind of experiences within the city is the emotional intention, whereas the stylistic intention is that I love speaking fast. I think it sounds really impressive. It's a it's a skill, a performance delivery skill that I've really uh, worked on and nurtured over my career. Um, so at this point, I would like you to just take really just two minutes at this point. These are just really short little exercises to go through um, your free written piece or your erased piece, whichever you like, and just jot down the bits that could be delivered a certain way, the bits that could be fast, slow, loud, quiet, just whatever comes to you spontaneously. Again, don't overthink it. We're just encouraging ourselves to look at our piece as a performance piece rather than a written piece. So really just take two minutes at this point. Um, again, it's a thing you can return to in your own time with a fuller bit. This is just an introduction to looking at our words, imagining the performance within it and jotting down how we might treat certain words and why. So again, two minutes, I will let you know when we're just about at time and we'll move on to a couple more exercises.
Okay, guys, let's just start wrapping up there. Um, Simon, I just saw your comment about um, using your accidental E in the in the univocal piece. You know, just, just yesterday, uh, so I, I recently wrote a, a piece for the Paisley Book Festival that I was working with, um, and I produced this poem, um, produced a film for the poem, all as part of the festival, and there was a section that was all univocal and I was just using A. Um, and I ran it by so many people, I read it so many times, I performed it, I filmed it, and just yesterday I realized that there was a sneaky E in the middle of all the A's, and I can't believe that it was never flagged up to me or that I never noticed, and now I feel very disappointed for myself that it was not a, a truly univocal piece. Um, but okay, so we, we have looked at initial delivery techniques for our piece, um, moving on very nicely kind of related to that. Um, I'd like to start thinking about silence. So at this point, I mean, I think it's good to remember that what sets spoken word apart um, from page poetry is its ability to very viscerally, obviously showcase silence. Silence is powerful when it is to complement pacing, to complement phrasing, to indicate gravity, to allow for humour. Or if you choose not to have any silence at all, that is a very deliberate a deliberate choice for your piece if you choose to just speak really relentlessly never stopping never giving the audience a chance to catch up with what you're saying not giving them a chance to breathe that is a, a deliberate choice within your performance style so at this point again just two minutes just going through your piece making a note of where you could add silence and why why you would do that what would be the choice between choosing to add or not to add any silence so just a couple of minutes on this one um, just as with our delivery techniques before. Okay, folks, let's leave that one there and just move straight on to our final delivery exercise before I'll just share a few um, of my favourite performance techniques with you. Um, this final delivery exercise is kind of relating to the, the microphone, the role of the microphone, the presence of the microphone. In spoken word performance, something very important and powerful, I think, is your acknowledgement that the microphone is there and a decision on what your relationship will be with it. The fact that you choose to have a mic on stage, I mean, sometimes it is not your choice, sometimes it's just there and you have to, you have to deal with it. Um, it's a statement, it's a deliberate act and it influences how an audience looks at you. Something that I think compromises performance quite often is a fear of the microphone. Um, instead, I would really encourage that you 
be deliberate with how you interact with it. So if you're going to take it off the stand, if you're going to use your hand to steady it, or if you're going to just leave it as it is, make it intentional. Something that I personally find very steadying uh, before starting a poem, before beginning a performance, is just to slightly adjust the mic, even if it doesn't need it. In fact, especially if it doesn't need it. Um, simply just kind of, you know, fiddling around with it, adjusting the height, the, any, anything, just kind of touching it and moving it slightly uh, to show that you acknowledge it and that you have taken control of it. Sometimes I will give the microphone a personality, um, almost like a, almost like another performer that I'm interacting on stage with uh, so that I know how to then go on and interact with it. For example, um, to return to my work with Siren and uh, our show Text Me When You Get Home, I have a piece, uh, a poem that I've contributed to the, to the show, to the script. It's to do with um, a woman, again poignantly, uh, walking home at, at night and the harassment and catcalls that she faces on the street. When I perform this poem, uh, as I go through its its kind of journey, I guess, I change my my body language around the mic. So this is a mic on a stand in front of me on stage. Um, the poem begins and the woman is, she's walking home from a, a work night out. She's a little bit tipsy. She's enjoying, um, she's enjoying walking through the Glasgow streets. She's enjoying the time of evening. Uh, she has that kind of slightly um, drunken swagger going on. And so as I'm reading this bit, I kind of hold the mic, hold the sand sometimes as though to sort of steady myself. We then progress through the poem a little and we get to the point where she is being catcalled by these men. Uh, there's a line that goes, um, <clears throat> it goes, it goes, take it all off, love, give us a show, love, which is the, the men kind of shouting to this woman. And at that point, I kind of almost like square up to the mic, I suppose, as though I am one of these men, as though I'm trying to display this sort of like brash, masculine uh, energy, I guess. Um, and so I'm interacting with the mic in that way. The, the poem goes on and she reclaims control. She reclaims power. She kind of harnesses all the, the, the sort of rage and support of, of all the women who came before her and is supported by that. Um, there's a bit, it, it sort of goes through these various different powerful women in history. It ends by uh, referencing Aretha Franklin. It goes, it shouts out R-E-S-P-E-C-T, female voices cross the ages, join in harmony to shriek us to, us to, this time, not you. And then at that point, as I'm going into the kind of concluding paragraph of the, of the poem, I will take the mic off the stand um, to kind of represent this woman literally like taking her power, claiming her power, holding it in her hand, being in control of her voice and that is just an example of this one poem and how I've crafted a, a sort of relationship with the microphone throughout it. So at this point, again, just for a couple of minutes before I share a final um, few techniques with you, I would just encourage you to go through your piece and map out a story, if you like, for the mic, just some key points where you might choose to interact with it in a certain way. And I think it's important, of course, to remember, remember that you will not always have a microphone. Uh, there is not always a microphone on stage, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but sometimes even imagining there to be one is your first step to communication, to addressing somebody else, to reaching an audience. So again, just take two minutes at this point, just going through a little bit of writing, imagining that you're reading it there with a microphone in front of you and just highlighting certain bits where you might choose to interact in a different way uh, with your microphone. So just two minutes before we start rounding off our session. Let's go.
Okay, guys, we're just going to wrap up that quick little exercise there just so I have a few minutes to uh, share some of my favorite, my favorite, famous, famous, possibly in time famous performance techniques uh, for practicing at home because um, I find it very useful. I find myself falling into my own patterns quite frequently. So I love uh, I love other people sharing their performance techniques with me. It certainly widens my own mind. To me, in essence, performance Performance for spoken word is all about breaking habits. It's all about breaking what comes most naturally to you in order to find a unique performance voice. I find that breaking muscle memory is very useful, even if you are a poet who isn't, or a performer of whatever form, who isn't overperforming the same piece, because certainly in my experience, poetry naturally lends itself to quite formulaic um, reading, simply due to its, its structuring and its reliance on rhythm. Learning to break my own rhythms, I must say, has had a wider reach than just in my creative work. Uh, learning to find your numerous different voices is empowering and is, is bold. And so I would keep that in mind with, with all of these exercises. Even if you never envisage yourself being a performer, it's quite interesting the way that practicing performance exercises impacts the way that you communicate at large and the different facets you, that you can find within yourself. So my three sort of key tips for just when I'm, I'm trying to read a piece of my own work and break the structure, the pattern that I've fallen into is to first go through and pick maybe like the second word or every fifth, so every second word, sorry, every fifth word and stress it. Um, simply to find an unnatural speaking pattern, a way that just feels quite horrible actually to read. Um, I also like to play with speed. I like to speed up where it feels wrong to. I like to slow down where it feels wrong to and assess how that impacts my performance. And I also like to put on different instrumental tracks behind me. So something big, orchestral, classical that I then read my poem over and then maybe something much more grounded, maybe hip hop based and see how that changes the way that I read. Half the time, most of the time, this feels horrible. It feels unnatural and clunky, but sometimes you unexpectedly come across something that works for you that you actually only found through pushing yourself and breaking your own boundaries um, and the two sort of other key exercises that i would encourage um first of all if you ever are finding yourself talking too fast or slightly zoning out mid-performance um, due either to nerves or being overly familiar with a piece which is definitely my problem i write in a very rhythmic way and so pretty much read this the, the same poem the same way every single time without any newness or freshness to it. If you're finding that to be an issue, I try to start thinking of the poem or the piece, the monologue, whatever it is, uh, as, as a memory. I deliberately pretend to be recalling what I'm saying um, as though it's just coming to me and sort of take pauses and slow my speech down as you would in the process of recollection, because it makes it seem as though the words are just coming to you. And therefore, this performance is something intimate, something shared only by you and your audience, which is lovely for an audience. But also it, uh, it allows you to sort of think a bit more heavily about each of the words that you're saying. And in the process of pretending that you're recollecting them, it gives more weight to them, even to yourself. And next and sort of final point is that you can really dress performance up and down in that its power comes from both the way that it is heightened and the way that it is stripped back. So when I practice performing a piece, first of all, I will perform it to myself um, with my eyes closed. Um, it brings an intimacy, I think, to the story. There is this slight sense of vulnerability through actually closing your eyes while also encouraging you to kind of paint a very vivid picture in your head uh, of, of what it is you're describing. In doing so, you learn which words are important as descriptors and you find yourself naturally altering your pacing. And second to that, af or after having performed to myself with my eyes shut, I will also perform my piece to somebody else. Or if I do not have somebody else to hand, I will imagine that I'm performing to somebody else. When you read your piece to another person and you see how they react, you see how you have to compensate for them, not knowing the story or the memory or the experience that you're sharing. 
um, which kind of breaks you out of complacency, which is very useful. And then I try to pair those two feelings together, the feeling of the intimacy and smallness of performing with, with closed eyes paired with this, the bigger feeling of incorporating a, another person. And those techniques together, I find immensely useful for uh, garnering an, an exciting and fresh feeling performance. But I do not want to eat into your evenings at all. So that is us. That is us at the end of our spoken word session. Um, thank you so much for your attention and involvement. I really hope you find this useful and that you can go and have fun playing around with words and creativity and speech. Um, as I mentioned, please do feel free to either reach out to myself or the Siren team um, with any questions, any thoughts. We always are very open to, to chatting and making new connections. So thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening and thank you for having me as a part of this festival. It's been such a pleasure.